الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله tonight we want to commemorate the martyrs that have been martyred in the way of Ahl al-Bayt, in the same footsteps as that that the Ahl al-Bayt were martyred before them. And we dedicate tonight's majlis, tonight's lecture in honor of these people that have fought to uphold the name of Ahl al-Bayt, died and were martyred to uphold the message died for the people that died before them. Now, inshallah, tonight we want to analyze a very important aspect in relations to the society we live in today. And this aspect, inshallah, we want to look at from three different steps or three different points. And this aspect is the misconception and the viewpoint that people might take into consideration when looking at the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt. As you know, many people may come forth and tell us that, you know what, kill them because they're kuffar. Other people may come forth and say what, that they are mughalin. Other people may come forth and say, you know what, the Shia are those that have elevated the Imams over the Prophet. And many other misconceptions that have come forth. Now, inshallah, it's our duty as each and every individual in this particular Husseiniya and everywhere around the world, it's our duty first and foremost to have knowledge of what the school of Ahl al-Bayt teaches us on the first level. And secondly, to correct every misconception that we may find within the world, within the communities that we live in, within universities, within high schools, even within primary schools even within someone's family. And inshallah, tonight we want to look at the very basis of these misconceptions. And we want to look at, at the first point in which someone may view the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt, in which we look at the viewpoint. Inshallah, tonight is dedicated to the viewpoint, how someone may come forth and look at the school of Ahl al-Bayt. And what problems arise when looking at the school of Ahl al-Bayt. And how do misconceptions come forth? Insha'Allah, you can assist me in starting the lecture tonight by reciting a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Insha'Allah, the first point I want to look at is the point we want to look at what is meant or what's a viewpoint of being poor and what's another viewpoint of being wealthy. As you know, someone once mentioned poor, what do you think of? When someone is mentioning someone that's poor, often people come with the conclusion that he's lacking money. Other people may come to the conclusion that, you know what, he doesn't have enough sustenance for a day. Others may come forth and say that he doesn't have enough sustenance for a week. Others may come and say month or a year. Different definitions of that which is poor. Islam has its own definition, of course. However, on the social level, when you find saying that someone or refer to someone as poor, often it's associated with sustenance. Often it's associated with wealth, money, status, possessions. Little do we look at the health of someone as being poor. If someone is lacking health, is often referred to as having poor health. The, the thing I want to look at tonight, in reference to someone being poor, is being poor in knowledge. Why? 
Because that's one of the most important faculties that we have to teach ourselves. If we lack knowledge, that is the true definition that we can take in this society nowadays, in the modern world, in the 21st century, if we lack knowledge of everything around us, if we lack the knowledge of our Imam, if we lack the knowledge of what the Ahl al-Bayt teach us, that in definition makes us poor. As in when we look at the people that come towards the shrine of Abu Abdullah, when we look at the people that come forth and say, you know what, we want to, alaykum salam wa rahmatullah, we look at the people that come forth and say the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt should be fought. And we have people such as ISIS, such as the people that call themselves Wahhabis, that come forth and say that all the Shias, the followers of the Prophet and his household, are the people that should be prosecuted, that should be killed anywhere in the land. We have to look at why. And this is the lack. When we look at them, we say, we not only look at them in anger and saying, why do they believe this? We should look at them with pity on the first level. Why? Because they do not have the knowledge. They do not see that great aspect that we have. That great miracle that Allah has gifted to us. Which is the wilayah of Ali ibn Abi Talib. If we look at it in essence, these people we have to look and pity. And say they do not have that which we have. That's why they've come to the conclusion that if we kill... Look at, look at the irony of their belief. So you may acknowledge what kind of system they believe in. They say, until today, you find the people that are going and bombing themselves. They say, we want to go and kill. And especially the people that kill in and around the Iraq area. In and around the shrines of Ahl al-Bayt. Look at the analogy that they are giving us. They say, we want to go towards heaven. By what? By killing the people that are visiting one of Sayyidai Shabab Ahl al-Jannah. Now look at that in an in, in instance. The irony of the sentence in itself. It contradicts itself. I want to go towards heaven. By killing the visitors of who the Prophet of Islam said is the master or one of the masters of the gate of paradise. There's only two. Hassan and Hussein. Sayyidai Shabab Ahl al-Jannah. They say we will kill the people that visit them in order to have whatever it may be, breakfast or lunch with the Prophet. And they go towards bombing themselves and they have a, a spoon or a fork in their pocket saying, you know what, when we are resurrected we will have breakfast or lunch with the Prophet. Look at, look at the, the lack of knowledge. This is what the truth is in being poor. The lack of knowledge of who Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad are. Therefore, on the reverse angle, if we want to ask who in our communities, who in the world that we can refer to as being wealthy, is it the one that has a large bank balance? Is it the one that has cars lined up in front of this house? Is it the person that owns buildings upon buildings? No. If we want to look at the truth in the wealth, the wealth that can be used in this dunya and the hereafter, the true wealth is the knowledge and the wilayah of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And on that reference, on the first hand, we are wealthy to have the door to knowledge. But we are not allowing ourselves to gain the full extent of this wealth. Because we do not go out and learn about the Ahl al-Bayt as much as we should. We don't go out and apply their knowledge to our lives. In that instance, when we do that, we'll truly be wealthy in that instance. Now let's look at one particular example on the second level. The first level we looked at the reference between being poor and being wealthy in knowledge, in ma'rifah. Now let's look at the difference of viewpoints. As in when someone looks at the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt and he seeks to understand, he goes out and he endeavors to understand the way we view our imams. The way we view not only our imams because that's what they firstly refer to. 
the way we view Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way we view the prophets, and then the way we, pr we view the imams, then you will realize how different the different schools of thought are. As in, when we look at these three concepts, when we look at God, when we look at the prophets and we look at the imams, there is something known to us as unlimited when looking at Allah. Whereas other schools of, of Islam, other schools of thought, not just in Islam, other schools of theology, other religions, they limit God. I'll give you an example before we move on to the analogy that should explain this in more detail. When someone comes forth and says and takes Jesus as his Lord, or when someone, as we know, and even in the time of Imam Ali, the reference, as in many lectures have come forth and they've given the example and the reference between Ali ibn Abi Talib and Jesus, son of Mary. Why? Because they're both had miracles upon miracles. They had great things that people cannot comprehend. And they were both in their time or before or after their time looked at to be divine. As in people have taken Jesus, son of Mary, and made him divine. And they've said, you know what? He's God or the son of God. And on the same level, people have come forth and taken Ali ibn Abi Talib. To be their Lord. Now we look at that and say no. This is against Islam altogether. And it's not only against Islam. And it's not only kafir. However, it's minimizing. It's lowering, number one. From the rank of Allah. Because they're limiting him. And secondly, from the rank of the Prophet and the Imams. As in how great. If they take Ali ibn Abi Talib. Or if they take Jesus, son of Mary, as their God. Or their divine figure. What injustice is that? When a person comes on and says, look at the injustice that they've done to Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, how great is the God or the Lord of Ali and the Lord of Jesus. If they, and they refer to Ali ibn Abi Talib and Jesus son of Mary as lords. He says, how great is the Lord if these people that they've made divine... Take that Lord, and they are their slaves. Look at that analogy. When we recite in the Shahada, the Prophet of Islam, what do we refer to him? Do we refer to him as a messenger first, or a slave? First, we refer to him as a slave. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ So someone may come forth and look at the religion of Islam through the spectacle or to, through the eyes of the Ahl al-Bayt and say what? And say these people that call themselves the followers of Ahl al-Bayt are extremists. How? They say that they are Mughalin. As an example, they say that, you know what? They give ranks to their Imams, to their Prophets far greater than what they deserve. Now what's the problem with this? When we look at the Imams and they say to us, says, lower us from divinity. Lower us from giving us the status of being divine. Lower us from that. It says, and say whatever you want about us. Say whatever you want. Why? It says, whatever you say, you will never reach the status that we are. Or what we are capable of. However, do not do injustice by making us divine. Yes, they are great. However, they are still slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the first instance that we must, we must look at. And I want to give you an example. Because the way we view our imams, the way we view Allah, the first aspect is he's infinite and he cannot be seen. One of the aspects of Tawheed, other schools of thought say no. They limit him to saying, you know what? And they refer to him as saying, well, ayyadu billah, they say God is embodied by a young man that rides well ayyadu billah a donkey comes down other hadith say what that he puts his leg in bodies again giving him a body part objectifying him puts it into hellfire to allow hellfire to calm down and you find in the school of thought of, of ahl al-bayt they say no god cannot be comprehended nor can you objectify him on the first instance and then we believe that our our prophets our imams are all infallible now the example I want to give you is a simile. 
given by a philosopher, a Greek philosopher by the name of Plato. He gives a simile to give us an example on understanding of the knowledge of the prophets, the knowledge of the imams, what they can see, what Allah has given them in reference to what we know and the belief that we have. Now, I want you all to concentrate for five minutes, just five minutes of your time. I need your complete attention to this particular simile because if you miss one point, it won't make sense to you. The simile of the cave goes as follows. I want you to imagine a group of people chained inside a dark cave. Example, chained, group of people, their entire life, they know nothing but this cave. They've been chained to this cave and all they can see in front of them is a wall. Behind them is a fire in the entrance. Their whole life they've been chained, they can't look right, or they can't look left. They don't know what the people in either side look like. They can only hear them. What they see is anyone that goes past the entrance, past the fire. They can see their shadows on the wall in front of them. And that's their life. So you can imagine that the same particular figure would pass by every day or every month or every year. And that particular shape, they may refer to it as such and such. Or a particular noise, it could be an animal, it could be a human. They recognize the voices, they say that voice belongs to this particular person. And that's the only knowledge that they have. Imagine that perspective. Now let's have that on our days. If we are only encompassed to that which we see, that which we are accustomed to, that which we think we know. Now let's take the example of the cave. Imagine someone broke free of the chains and they went out of that cave. And they began to see everything as it actually is, in its essence. They began to see that those shadows belong to actual humans. They begin to see that those voices and where it's being uttered from. They begin to see that the shadows were formed by people going past that particular fire. They begin to see everything in its essence. Now imagine this. That person that went out and saw all of it and began to know the truth, and understood the truth, and the essence. Imagine when he goes back. Imagine that being prophets and being imams, knowing the truth of the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, understanding the miracles, seeing that which is unseen, such as the malaika, such as the levels of heaven, such as the levels of the earth, the miracles of Allah, having knowledge of all this. Now imagine that figure that went out of the cave returned to the cave. Imagine trying to explain himself towards the people that only know the shadows on the walls. Imagine, what would he have to do? People on the first hand would say that you're a liar because they can't comprehend it. On the second, they'll, they'll say you're a magician. He'll be taken out of that circle. He'll be looked down upon. They will tell him, stop talking like that. Because we can't comprehend it. It doesn't fit into our capacity, our mental capacity. That person will be isolated. Now imagine the Prophet of Islam. Do we remember what happened when he brought the message on the first level? When the Prophet brought the message and he began to tell them of the truth. People couldn't comprehend it. They say, no, we've always prostrated to, towards these idols. We know not of a creator. We cannot comprehend that there is a creator. They could not comprehend that there's something greater than this universe. Because to them, what they can see and the limit to what they can see, that's the only limitations. As in a person came towards Imam Sadiq, alayhi afdal salati wa salam, and he asked him. He said, and he came because he was an atheist and he wanted to ask the imam. He saw that he didn't know it was the Imam. He was he was told he was in he was in Medina. He goes to Medina. He was in Mecca. He goes to Mecca. In Tawaf, he bumps shoulders. Look at the look at the knowledge of the Imams. They knew exactly what the people come to ask from them. He hits shoulders with the Imam. He doesn't know it's the Imam. And the person straight away, the Imam looks at him. And he says, what's your name? Look at the way the Imams approach the, th the questions and how they give each and every individual exactly what they want to hear. 
He says, what's your name? He says, my name is Abdul Malik. So the Imam straight away, he's got him in the circle. He says, I want to ask you, this Malik that you say that you are a slave or an abid for, is he a Malik of the earth or the Malik of the heavens? So the person's automatically saying, how does he even know I'm going to ask that question? The Imam says, don't worry. Wait until I finish my tawaf and I'll come to you. He comes to him after. He says, oh man, straight away, doesn't he knows exactly what he's about to ask. He says, oh man. He says, have you gone all the way towards the east? He says, no. He says, have you gone all the way towards the west? He says, no. He says, have you gone and ascended towards the skies? He says, no. He says, do you believe there's anything in the earth? He says, well, maybe. He says, that's not a legitimate answer. He says, if you, don't, if you haven't traveled all the way towards the east, nor the west, nor do you have knowledge of what's in the earth or the heavens, how is it if you haven't explored these places that you say that there is not a creator that exists? If you haven't gone and explored and understood and endeavored to understand, how is it that you can come towards conclusions like that? Straight away the Imam. The Prophet, when he began to deliver his message, the people, what did they call him? The first level, they didn't comprehend it. They called him, you are a magician. On the first level. On the second, they, think, they taught the Prophet that you are crazy. You are insane. It's ironic because before the message, the people only used to refer to the Prophet as As-Sadiq al Amin. The trustworthy and the truthful. That's the two things he was known by. Nowadays, because that's yes, that's in the Prophet's time. How's it, how does it apply to, it, to our days? How does it apply to the 21st century? And in precise reference to this simile, nowadays when you look at people and you try to show them the way we look at Ahlul Bayt, the way we view Ahlul Bayt, the way we view the Prophet and his household, even before that, the way we view Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's on a different level, in different lenses, in a different spectacle. When they look through that lens, they begin to say, well, we can't comprehend it. We can't imagine this. When you bring someone that believes solely and wholeheartedly, he believes that Muawiyah was on the truth. You bring someone like that, or you bring someone that wholeheartedly believes that Yazid was on the truth. Those are their followers, the people that come forth and say, you know what, we can't comprehend how Ali ibn Abi Talib is on the truth. Imam Ali gives us a beautiful example. After the battle of Jamal, someone comes to Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, Oh Ali, I was in the battle of Jamal. Imam Ali alayhi salam looks at him, he says, which side were you on? Which side? Were you on the opposition? Or were you on the truth? Which side were you on? He looks at the Imam and he says, Oh Imam, I looked at particular figures. I looked one side of the army, I saw the wife of the Prophet. I saw companions that were at the time of the Prophet. Or known to be companions such as Talha, such as Zubair. I saw these figures. And I saw them alongside the Prophet once upon a time. And on the other level, I saw companions such as Malik. I saw companions... Such as Ammar, I saw companions, such as yourself, O oh, Amirul Mu'mineen. He says, you cannot blame me for not choosing the correct size because there were people on both ends. Now, let's look at it in a 21st century perspective. Nowadays, and this is one of, if not the biggest problem that we may have nowadays, is when we look at figures throughout history, and nowadays, when we look towards our scholars, or if we look towards someone that is of an educated background, we straight away say, you know what, he's educated, I will follow in his footsteps. Or he is a scholar, or he believes in Ahlul Bayt, or he says that he's Shia, that I will follow him 100%. Ali ibn Abi Talib teaches us then and there a valuable lesson that we have to apply on the 21st century to each and every one of our lives. What does he say? Look at the beauty of Ali ibn Abi Talib's words. Two sentences. 
but look how much it applies nowadays. He says, I, you need to seek the truth. On the first level, what does he say? He says, don't seek out the people. He says, first you have to seek the truth. First you have to know what the truth is. You have to know what the message is. You have to understand what the Ahl al-Bayt stood for. He says, first level, you have to know what the truth is. Then you will know its figures. Look at Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, know the truth and you will know its people. When you look at the truth, what does the Prophet say? Even in that instance, he says, in an instance, he says the truth is with Ali as one of the examples. And Ali is with the truth. That's the biggest dalil. Someone can come bring forth in all the wars. The truth is with Ali and Ali is with the truth. It revolves around him wherever that he goes. That's one of the aspects that we have to apply to our lives in the 21st century. We have to have knowledge to decipher the fact. We have to have knowledge of our religion before we can come towards conclusions. We can't just come forth without hearing both parties. We have to understand the ethics of Ahl al-Bayt. Apply it within our lives. And that's one of the problems. As I said, going back to the example of the simile of the cave, nowadays, it's our duty to defend all these misconceptions that have come forth about the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt. When someone doesn't know the truth, help them see the light. Be as the Prophet says, be like water. Purify all those around you. Purify all those around you. Have that effect on your friends, on your family. Show them, teach them by first teaching yourself and then delivering the correct message. And I want to end, inshallah, on a note, looking at the shuhada. Looking at the levels, because we wholeheartedly believe and have yaqeen, certainty in the levels that a shaheed can reach. We have yaqeen that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reference to the shuhada has elevated their ranks, have given them specific ranks, specific access in the day of judgment, in the hereafter, doors of shafa'a, these people that have died defending the message, their blood being spilt, knowing that the shaheed, not only is he elevated in their rank, but also even their blood, even looking at their blood, something that we may look at as impure, their blood in itself is pure becomes. Imagine what level you have to be at to have that accustomed to you. I want to give an example of a lecturer that says this particular story. And I'm, I may have said it previously, but it applies tonight more than any other night when we look at the shuhada. As in when we look at these people that have a lack of knowledge and that we refer to as being poor, not knowing the truth about Ahl al-Bayt, not knowing the levels that they reached, the close nudes that they have towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we look at these people, and we see that time and time again, they think that by bombing, they think by threatening, scaring, that they will minimize the visitors of Abu Abdullah. By having weapons, by having threats, by having an army, that they can minimize the people that go and visit Abu Abdullah. And they think nowadays, subhanAllah, people nowadays, what do they, do? What do they, what do they think they're doing? They're bombing. People thrive and they have a thirst for shahada nowadays they want to be rid of this dunya and go towards the ahl al-bayt die in the message attain that rank in the eyes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they have yaqeen in this and we have yaqeen that whenever this happens that the imams are there and then will be there and take a shaheed by his hand I want to give you an example by a lecturer by the name of Sheikh Jafar al-Ibrahim and he, re he relates this story to one of his good friends. He says, I had a person. He says, I wouldn't be saying it on the pulpit if I didn't know this person was of a high status and he was telling the truth. Because it's something to hear something and it's another level believing it. This Sayyid, he says that we were in a mawkib. You know, at the time of Muharram, everyone has a mawkib. From 
Najaf towards Karbala, side by side. Subhanallah, it's a beautiful scene. It's honestly a heavenly scene that you see. And on the way, he says that there was a bomb that took place. The person narrating it, he says, in the blast, I didn't have too many injuries, but I was still taken towards the hospital. He says, a person next to me, he was a Sayyid, he says, as soon as the blast took place, he was unconscious. He says, he remained unconscious next to me. He says, on the second day, he awoke and he began to slap himself viciously. Slapping himself and slapping himself. So he says, I begin to tell him, why are you slapping yourself? I began to give him reassurance, telling him that, don't worry, you're fine. You haven't lost a limb. Your boys are safe. Everything's okay. The person looks at him and says, what are you talking about? Everything's okay. He says, do you know what's happened? He says, what's happened? He says, I want to ask you about Fulan. And he refers to their names. He says, he attained martyrdom, hasn't he? He says, yes. He says, another person, he's attained martyrdom as well, hasn't he? He says, yes. But he says, it's strange. Why? He says, you've been unconscious. How is it possible that you have that knowledge that they've passed away? That they've been martyred? And that they've died in the blast? How do you have knowledge of this? You've been unconscious. He says, I want to tell you something. He says, when the blast took place, he says, I saw with my very eyes Imam Hussein alayhi salam be present there and then. He says, when he was present, he looked at Fulan. These two people that he mentioned that have been martyred. He says, he looked at that person. He says, do you want to come with me? He says, of course. He looked at the other person. He says, you want to come with me? He says, of course. He says, he looked at me, and he says, do you want to come? The person says, well, I thought to myself, I've just married my sons. I still have to prepare them for marriage life. I still have to make sure. So I told the imam, I'm not yet ready. And he says, and, and, and that moment I awoke. And he says, that's why I'm slapping myself. Why didn't I go with my imam? Giving us the example that what? The shuhada have a rank. The imam has a place in the hearts of every mu'min. The imam say, there is a fire that emerges in the hearts of every mu'min when Hussein is mentioned. The rank of a shaheed is beyond comprehension, brothers and sisters. And we commemorate on this night the people that have sacrificed their life in order for the message of Islam to remain in order for the teachings of Ahlul Bayt to remain being taught. If it wasn't for their sacrifice, following in the footsteps of Sayyid al-Shuhada that not only sacrificed himself, but his entire family. So the name and the message of Islam survives throughout the, throughout the timeline of history and until the day of judgment. We want to, inshallah, on this night, pray to Allah on the first level, that he may allow us to attain such a high rank. If it's not a rank of shaheed, then I want to attain a rank that Allah will be pleased with us. And that our Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman is pleased with us. And I, we want to recite a Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha and reward this Surah to every shaheed, to all the families of the shuhada, everyone that has lost any one of their family members, whether it be near or distant. We want to pray to Allah and recite them a fatiha, but before three of your loudest salawat, ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.